Hello, I'm Andrea Derup, a professor of pathology at Duke University School of Medicine, where I'm the course director for our Pathology Medical School course. I'm also a co-editor of Robbins Essential Pathology and of the upcoming edition of Robbins and Kumar Basic Pathology. This is the second talk in my series on race in medicine. The first one was Race in Robbins, which focused on how we address race in the 10th edition of Robbins Basic Pathology and what we are doing moving forward. I'd like to continue our discussion of race in medicine, but before we begin, we really have to talk about our definitions. So what is race? This talk is being prepared on the eve of a grand rounds that I will be giving at Johns Hopkins University on October 11th, 2021. This happens to be a day that's been set aside as Indigenous Peoples Day, which serves as a reminder for me to recommend that if you have not read the book, Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee, or if it has been a long time since you've read it, it's really an amazing book, uh, which is very challenging and difficult to read, uh, but which is uh, an important reminder of our history uh, in these United States. So I do highly recommend this. When we consider what is race, we have to recognize that in modern biology, races are defined by two criteria, the amount of genetic variation within and the amount of gen genetic variation between groups, as well as phylogenetic evidence of unique lineage. And neither of these is seen in modern humans. It has long been known that humans show more variability within so-called races than between them. Now, we do have geographically based genetic and physical differences, but we share 99.9% .9 of our DNA. Race is a social construct, and for a really good discussion of this, I recommend Stamped from the Beginning, The Definitive History of Racist Ideas in America by Ibram Kendi. Uh, the website dismantlingracism.org uh, is another excellent source. So this image I'm showing here is showing the five races that were described by Johann Friedrich Blumenbach in the 18th century. Uh, he was not uh, a racist, but he defined what he considered to be the different uh, races uh, in, in the human species. And when I say that he's not a racist, he was simply describing what he saw as variation. So I'll describe what racism is shortly. So we have to recognize that there's a difference between the concept of biological race and socially defined race. So biological race, as I said, does not exist in modern humans. Socially constructed or socially defined race does, and it arbitrarily uses aspects of morphology, geography, culture, language, religion, etc., in the service of a social dominance hierarchy. So when I say that Blumenbach did, was not racist, he was not describing these races in the service of a social dominance hierarchy that really came uh, into use uh, in the United States uh, to support uh, the institution of chattel uh, slavery. So as Merrill said in Introduction to Epidemiology, Race is a socially constructed variable based on the idea that some human populations are distinct from others according to external physical characteristics or places of origin. Racial or ethnic variations in health-related states or events are explained primarily by exposure or vulnerability to behavioral, psychosocial, material, or environmental risk factors and resources. This is a really critical sentence because when you see in the scientific literature references to different disease incidents or prognosis based on socially defined race, it is primarily due to these behavioral, psychosocial, material, or environmental risk factors. It is not due to biological race. Okay, so I showed you the image earlier of what Blumenbach uh, considered to be the five races, and we jump forward 200 years, and this is what the U.S. Census Bureau gives us, okay? Uh, and these definitions are incredibly problematic. Uh, for example, the definition of white has uh, changed and shifted uh, through, through history. We describe black or African American as a person having origins in any of the black racial groups of Africa, considering the fact that there is more genetic variation in Africa than there is in any of the other areas, any of the other populations. If we look at this uh, category American Indian or Alaska Native, 
Uh, there is a cultural criterion because it's not just the origins in the original peoples. It has to maintain tribal affiliation or community attachment. So you can shift back and forth with your race simply by how you view your affiliation. And then if we look at Asia, uh, look at this huge range, and I'm going to go into some more detail. A person having origins in any of the original peoples of the Far East, Southeast Asia, or or the Indian subcontinent. So Cambodia, China, India, Japan, Korea, I mean, this, this is a huge geographic expanse. And as, um, as you'll see, with ge geographic expanse, you have genetic variation. And then we have the native Hawaiian or other Pacific Islanders. So let's take a look uh, just here. This is uh, from the Encyclopedia Britannica showing Asia. This is the, the definition of Asia. Although, uh, as I mentioned in the, in the U.S. Census Bureau uh, definition, the Middle East is now considered white. Uh, that has shifted. But even if you leave out uh, the Middle East, you can see that, that Asia is huge. This is a gigantic uh, geographic expanse. And you can imagine there being a huge amount of genetic variability. And if we see a statement like, the Pfizer COVID vaccine is 74.4% effective in Asian Americans, according to the FDA. This immediately raises the question of which Asians? What, what, to what are you referring? So let's take another look. Uh, this is uh, Asia again, I've, I, I've outlined in black. And we're going to do a deeper dive on this particular image because it's a very rich image. Uh, this uh, particular uh, uh, figure is showing uh, the distribution of a variety of hemoglobinopathies. So we can see here in green, we have the thalassemias, which are extending all the way through this area over here. We have hemoglobin S, which you'll know uh, better perhaps as uh, sickle cell disease, uh, hemoglobin C here. But my point in showing you this is that this area is Asia, and we can't really say anything meaningful about Asians and the hemoglobinopathies, right? So some parts of Asia do have thalassemias and some have sickle cell, but there are other huge areas that do not. So what defines uh, these, uh, these areas of these hemoglobinopathies? So this has to do with genetically based resistance to malaria. So what defines the, the distribution of these diseases is not a country or a political boundary or even a continent. It has to do with where are there mosquitoes? that have malaria. So let's do a little bit of a deeper dive on that. Okay, so now we have this image and we're looking, going to focus now uh, primarily on, on Africa. But I want to focus here on sickle cell disease because in the United States, we typically refer to sickle cell disease as the African-American disease. I mean, that is the link uh, that we make. But as you can see from this, this image, um, there are large areas of Africa that don't have uh, alleles for hemoglobin S, right? This area here where the Sahara is, there aren't any mosquitoes, right? So if your, uh, your, your, your ancestors came from this area, there is no genetic or evolutionary pressure uh, to have a hemoglobin S allele. Furthermore, we can see we've got hemoglobin S here in the Mediterranean, uh, in the uh, Middle East, and in India. Right? So if we focus on this idea of, uh, of sickle cell disease as an African-American uh, disease, we are going to not only be looking at a huge continent in which many people do not have any uh, evolutionary reason to have hemoglobin S, but we're going to miss other areas, other populations that could have that. And we'll be so fixated on looking at the color of someone's skin and making a judgment on what their socially defined race is that we will, make, we will miss a diagnosis. All right, so now we're going to focus primarily on Africa. Now, as I mentioned, we have uh, sickle cell here in this orange band. We have some uh, hemoglobin C uh, over here. Now, I want to just uh, make another comment here, which is that remember that what is driving the allele incidence is going to be evolutionary pressure based on exposure to mosquitoes that carry malaria. Now, if you look at Kenya, uh, Kenya here has got, uh, definitely has sickle cell alleles. But if you think about Kenya, it is a mountainous country. That's why there's you know, great coffee that comes from Kenya. And if you're to think about the thought experiment, if you have an individual who comes from a mountain tribe, whose ancestors come from there, 
then they would not have any pressure from mosquitoes. And so they would have no greater risk for sickle cell than someone from the United Kingdom. Now, there, it's very interesting because with climate change and with migration patterns, we can no longer look at distant uh, evolutionary uh, pressures, but we have to recognize the fact that we are a global society. And that's another point. Population admixture is a huge factor in why this idea of biological race uh, is not useful. All right, so here we have a map looking at sickle cell, uh, so hemoglobin S and hemoglobin C alleles. Now, if we were to overlay this uh, with a map that showed the uh, origin of enslaved peoples uh, from the history of uh, our country, even if you knew nothing about uh, who we are now, the United States, you would imagine that we would have a fair amount of hemoglobin S, and it looks like we'd have some hemoglobin C as well. So even if you knew nothing about the United States, that would be a reasonable hypothesis. And it turns out you'd be right. So this is uh, a study from uh, Howard University at a sickle cell screening clinic, uh, where you can see that we do in fact have a fairly high incidence of hemoglobin S, uh, as well as hemoglobin C. So you may be thinking, okay, I can't just say it's an African disease, but I can put this together in my mind and think about origins, and I can come up with a story that's meaningful. However, it gets much more complicated. So in addition to the fact that, as I demonstrated earlier, the sickle cell allele can be seen in the Mediterranean, in the Middle East, and in India, you have to recognize the fact that a rising share of the U.S. black population is foreign-born. So we have a global population. We have this mixing that is going on. And you cannot make an assumption, even if someone comes in and they have no accent, they could be a first generation who's just moved here from Africa. Right? So you cannot look at someone and make a presumption about what their evolutionary uh, ancestry uh, has, what the impact that has had on their current uh, genetics. Uh, furthermore, because of population admixture, about 16% of uh, the African American ancestry is European. And this is if we define African Americans as Americans descended from enslaved persons. Okay, so population admixture, uh, globalization, and uh, the wide genetic diversity, and the fact that we have a whole continent, uh, some of which is affected by malaria and some of which is not, means you cannot call this an African American disease. So let's talk a little bit about population admixture, okay, because I mentioned earlier that about 99.9% .9 of our genes, are, of our genetic material is the same. Now the differences tend to be in things that we can recognize as a tribal species, right? This is one of the things we do, we recognize, are you like me, are you different from me? And these things are very superficial, right? They have to do with uh, hair type, skin color, uh, uh, eye shape, right? Um, and they don't reflect accurately the genetic ancestry uh, of someone. And so this is looking at uh, results from 23andMe, looking at um, uh, individuals of African ancestry. And you can see here, so we have mean African ancestry here, is shown in blue, and mean European ancestry here. So in Washington state, we have a very high degree of uh, European ancestry, as well as in West Virginia, okay? And this is due to chattel slavery. What this tells you is that if you're seeing a patient who's, uh, who appears to you to be of African descent, uh, and perhaps they have uh, some thrombophilia, you need to consider factor V Leiden, right? Because a heterozygote for factor V Leiden, which we typically think of as being seen in individuals of European ancestry could be very well represented in the patient that you are, are currently seeing. Now this becomes even more complicated when we look at Latinx uh, individuals uh, because for uh, individuals of Latinx ancestry we're looking not only at European uh, but also of uh, Amerindian uh, uh, background. So we have African mixed with European mixed with uh, Amerindian. 
Uh, and you can see here that there is a huge, again, a huge uh, difference and disparity depending on which uh, state you're looking at, uh, how much of this population admixture you see. And this is particularly important because a lot of individuals consider the, the Latino, Latina, the Latinx population to be almost this amorphous mass. Like we've, This is a category, but it's very varied. And let's look uh, more closely at why this is. So this is a, a really nice study uh, that looks at genetic ancestry of Latin American populations. Now what is going to determine the population admixture is going to be the history of that particular uh, country. So was there slavery? Uh, was this an area that had uh, a very, uh, had an, um, an Amer Amerindian uh, uh, population that was decimated perhaps by smallpox, right? So what happened? What was the history of that particular country? And you can see if you look at Puerto Rico, uh, an individual from there, about 72% of their genetic ancestry is going to be European with only a minor uh, contribution from Amerindian uh, and uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. Contrast that with someone from Peru where uh, the vast majority is Amerindian. Now Mexico is um, the country that uh, has the greatest contribution to uh, the United States uh, uh, Latinx population. And you can see here again, we have a strong contribution from Amerindian uh, as well as European, but a smaller amount uh, from Sub-Saharan Africa. So this is, you know, this is a, a smallish area here and there's such wide difference in admixture. So keep that in mind when you're trying to think of, uh, oh, this person is Hispanic. What does that mean? How accurate is that a reflection? Does it tell you anything about their genetic background? Okay, so to bring this in, I'm going to, to finish with one more statement. So biological race does not exist in modern humans. Socially constructed defined race does. And so the idea is not to completely forget that socially defined race exists because socially defined race is going to have a huge impact on health and health disparities. But what is going to be important, as I showed earlier with the population admixture, is to take your mind away from looking and, and defining people by race. And that's challenging because that's what we do in the health system, right? I mean, we have our patients put down uh, what their race is. Uh, this is increasingly complicated by the fact that more and more people in this country are defined as mixed race, right? As we continue to uh, have a globalized uh, population and as we uh, find uh, and mate uh, in a random fashion, uh, there's more and more population admixture. So how do you, as a physician or a future physician, how do you deal with this, right? So what I think is important uh, is not to look at somebody and think, ah, this person is a socially defined African American, or oh, that person is a socially defined Asian. Because the social definition can be useful in terms of access to care. Are they getting uh, vaccinations? Do they, um, do they have issues with poverty, uh, health insurance? Are they collected in an area that has greater environmental pollution? There are definite issues of socially defined race. But when I want to think about the biology of someone, what I'm going to ask is, tell me about the, the health issues, the diseases, et cetera, of your brothers and sisters, your cousins, your parents, your aunts and uncles, your grandparents. That's going to tell me more about the uh, genetic background of that individual than looking at someone and saying, well, he looks African American and he says he's from Kenya, but gosh, I don't know if he's from the mountains of Kenya. I don't know how much population admixture there was. Forget about that, right? Don't use these big categories. Don't go down this rabbit hole of socially defined race, trying to find biological factors. Talk with your patients, ask them what their background is, and that is going to help you much more than any of these categories. So I'd like to thank you very much for your attention. 
Um, you can shoot me an email at pathologycentral at gmail.com. Please subscribe if you like this and add comments about what is useful, what you want to see more of. Uh, there are, I have a lot of different uh, videos planned uh, for this series and I'm really excited uh, to know what it is that works for you and what you want to learn more about. So thank you very much.